the five neurotransmitters that are increased with alcohol leaves out three. And guess what stimulates that? Nicotine. That's why when people are trying to quit smoking and they have a sip of alcohol, they'll notice that their brain is out of balance and they really have a craving for nicotine. Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Bishop. I'm a board certified family practice doctor. I also spent 10 years in the Air Force taking care of fighter pilots. Today I want to talk about something that is probably one of the most common things I have to explain to patients and this is about alcohol and the neurotransmitters involved. Uh, when I was a resident, um, I did some moonlighting in a addiction clinic. Moonlighting is when you have your job as a resident and then you have your medical license where you can operate outside of that residency program to work and make some extra money to pay the bills because residency doesn't pay too much. And I had worked in an addiction clinic primarily for patients uh, coming off of heroin. There was a lot of alcohol abuse. Uh, there was also a lot of patients who were dependent on benzodiazepines. Um, so understanding a neurotransmitter-based approach to these patients was extremely important. A lot of our approach was based off of a great book uh, from a physician named uh, Frederick von Steiff. It's called Brain in Balance. When he talks about how do you approach a very complicated picture of addiction where it's not just alcohol, but it's also benzodiazepines like Xanax. It's also people who are addicted to opiates, people who are addicted to multiple things at the same time with underlying bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia, or anxiety, or depression. And how do you approach that complicated picture? They try to break it down into neurotransmitters. And that's why this is so important when you understand actually what alcohol does to your brain chemicals or your neurotransmitters. So first, let's talk a little bit about the problems with alcohol. The problem with alcohol is that over time, symptoms get progressively worse. And we understand the neurotransmitters behind it, then you understand why that happens. Before we get started, I just want to say, when it comes to alcohol, I am not the person who's going to tell you never to touch a sip of alcohol again. I brew my own beer. I brew a fantastic American pale ale called Freedom Fries. The problem with alcohol is with frequency of consumption. I really encourage patients to never drink more than two days per week and no more than two drinks per occasion. Above that line is where we start to see some of the changes with alcohol, and let's explain why. So you have eight neurotransmitters. Alcohol is our miracle drug. Alcohol affects five out of those eight neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters are amino acids like GABA and glutamate. There are other neurotransmitters that are amino acids like glycine. Glycine seems to be more effective in your peripheral circulation, not centrally. Um, it helps to rebuild muscles and tendons. Glycine is also important as a calming neurotransmitter in your body. It's not as active in the brain, so for the sake of this uh, discussion, we're just going to talk about the amino acids of glutamate and GABA. GABA is the calming neurotransmitter. This is the main thing that alcohol works on. Um, so this is the calming effect that people get from alcohol. It kind of takes the edge off, makes people feel more relaxed, um, and thus is one of the main problems. In comparison, the opposite of that is glutamate. Glutamate is the excitatory neurotransmitter in your brain. And this is why when people drink alcohol, sometimes they tend to have more energy. They seem to be more outgoing. They seem to be uplifted. Additionally, when we talk about neurotransmitters, we have our monoamines. So in this particular case, we're going to talk about dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is your brain's version of adrenaline. Dopamine is our kind of reward center, and it makes us feel happy. In comparison, serotonin also works on mood, but serotonin is more so associated with feelings of contentment and joy. Dopamine is more so related to pleasure. Additionally, we have peptide neurotransmitters. Uh, for this particular discussion, we'll talk about opiates, which works on pain receptors and pain sensation. This is why we could use alcohol in the Civil War. Jack Daniels was used as an anesthetic because it worked on pain receptors. Additionally, you have a category of other neurotransmitters. Think about acetylcholine and endogenous cannabinoids. Marijuana works on these receptors. Acetylcholine is involved with movement and works as a signaling molecule for your muscles. Alcohol, from a neurotransmitter standpoint, is our miracle drug. It affects five out of your eight neurotransmitters. The closest that we've been able to come is Wellbutrin, which works on three neurotransmitters. The problem is that not all of those neurotransmitters stimulate and then wear off at the same time. 
So when somebody takes a drink of alcohol, it's increasing levels of five of those neurotransmitters. They're getting some GABA, which makes them feel calm. They're getting some serotonin, which makes them feel happy. They're getting some opiates, which helps with pain. They're getting some dopamine, which helps with pleasure, and even a little bit of stimulation on your endogenous cannabinoids. That's how you have somebody who takes some alcohol and they don't feel pain, they don't feel subconscious, and they kind of end up dancing on the table. The fundamental problem that we have with alcohol is when all of these neurotransmitters are elevated, some of them wear off quickly. The main balance that we see is between GABA and glutamate. GABA being that calming neurotransmitter, unfortunately wears off in about 24 hours, and glutamate stays elevated for multiple days. This is why alcoholics have alcohol withdrawal seizures, is after two to three days, their GABA has decreased back to its baselines or lower, and their glutamate remains elevated and unopposed. And that unopposed stimulatory neurotransmitter in your brain is what lowers seizure threshold or makes it easier to have seizures. This is why alcohol withdrawal is so dangerous and can be fatal. Notably, one thing that can help to balance unopposed glutamate is magnesium. Having magnesium can greatly decrease that excitation that people have. We also use this to prevent seizures in certain patients in the hospital setting. But having magnesium can help to balance out that over-excitatory glutamate that's in your brain. When people drink on a daily basis, unfortunately, this gap between GABA and glutamate gets a little bit worse over time and gets worse and worse each day. People having problems with alcohol withdrawal seizures is not dependent on a certain quantity of alcohol that you consume. Everyone's brain reacts differently to these imbalances of neurotransmitters. So we can't just say, well, this person drinks five drinks a day, they're going to have seizures. This person drinks four drinks a day, they're going to be fine. It's how each person's body, it's the amount of time that people have been drinking, it's the quantity, it's how their body responds to it. It can be a very difficult picture and you have to treat each patient individually. If you go to the hospital and you drink regularly, they'll probably monitor you closely and consider adding medications that will increase that GABA level to calm down that unopposed glutamate. But if you get admitted to the hospital and you haven't had a drink in three days, that's where we start to see DTs or delirium tremens, which is alcohol withdrawals. Some hospitals have a protocol where they will give you medications that will stimulate GABA to kind of calm down some of that overexcitatory glutamate. Other hospitals have protocols where they will actually just give you alcohol at a low dose, say, put a small cooler in your room and allow you to have a certain amount of alcohol if you have no interest in all of a sudden stopping drinking to prevent those alcohol withdrawal seizures so you can go back to your baseline when you go back home. I think there's pros and cons to both of those options. That's a different topic altogether. Interestingly enough, the five neurotransmitters that are increased with alcohol leaves out three. And guess what stimulates that? Nicotine. That's why when people are trying to quit smoking and they have a sip of alcohol, they'll notice that their brain is out of balance and they really have a craving for nicotine. And that's why a lot of people will say they only smoke when they drink. And that's a great example as to how the imbalance of neurotransmitters can drive your emotions and your feelings and your cravings. So being aware of what you're doing to your neurotransmitters greatly gives you more insight into the effects that those neurotransmitters have on your behavior and your cravings. I appreciate listening to our discussion on alcohol. I cannot stress enough that alcohol is to be taken very seriously. And if you're struggling with alcohol, I, I really encourage you to get some help. This video is for information purposes only. I just want to give you more of an insight to understand how complicated this picture is. You need to be working with a physician, either a licensed medical doctor who's a primary care physician or a licensed psychiatrist who can help you if you're struggling with alcohol addiction. I really encourage you to understand that this can be more complicated than you think. Each person has to be treated individually. As we said, you can't just make assumptions about how someone's gonna to respond to therapies. You really need to work with a doctor that takes the entire picture into account before they make recommendations on how to treat you. Hopefully you learned something in this discussion. If you have any questions about alcohol or other neurotransmitters, please talk to your doctor. Please get a primary care physician that you feel comfortable talking to and be honest with them. See them on a regular basis and they can help you prevent problems with time. Thanks again for tuning in. I'm Dr. Bishop.